This film is a story of bravery and vision on the part of women religious in Canada, members of some 50 Roman Catholic congregations of women who for almost 400 years built and managed a caring, competent, and not-for-profit system of hospitals and long-term care facilities. In total, 278 hospitals and 143 long-term care facilities were built across Canada in this period three of which were established by religious congregations of men. These 50 congregations of women religious built a health care system that provided access to primary and long-term care for all who came to the doors of these facilities based on the values of the social gospel. We will visit with six of these congregations of women religious who built and managed almost half of these facilities across Canada. From the first hospital in 1639, these congregations of women religious have modeled a system of health care delivery that is reflected in what Canadians cherish as a right of citizenship, the publicly funded and accessible health care system known as Medicare, which is also caring, competent, and not-for-profit. This film will examine the role of women religious in nine significant periods in the history of healthcare in Canada. It is a narrative that is not all that familiar to most Canadians, but one that deserves to be told. Our story begins in 1639 in New France in the fortress city of Quebec on a promontory overlooking the St. Lawrence River. The first congregation of women religious, Les Augustines de la Miséricorde de Jésus from Dieppe, France, arrived to the invitation of a Jesuit, Father Paul Lejeune, who was a missionary to the First Nations in what was then New France. So we know that the Jesuits, when they were here, they were writing what we call the Jesuit Relations, and essentially newsletters back to France, uh, explaining the ministry. And that's where Father Lejeune will write about a community that he had met back in France. And he says, if that hospital was here in, in New France, their charity could do more for evangelization than all of our steps and our words. And it's at that invitation that ourselves, the Augustinians and the Ursulines, will cross the ocean in 1639 and found the first hospital in North America. So there was a small colony here. At the beginning, the sisters will establish here in the city, and then they will actually head down to Sillery, closer to the water, really, uh, to be closer to the First Nations people. They will stay there about four years, but it ends up being too dangerous, so they have to return to the city, and, and that's where they will build the uh, hospital that is still here today. And they brought with them one, uh, one trunk that contained everything that was precious. There was both the documents, so the patent letters that gave them authorization to come here to Canada. They had what they needed to uh, serve the sick. So they had some of the seeds for the gardens. They had the uh, bandages that they would have needed, though they didn't have enough of that. They used their dresses eventually. Um, and they had the three keys were for the three sisters. Each sister had their own key. And it was to signify as well the unity of the community as they embarked here on this adventure. In the Museum of the Monastery in Quebec City is this painting by Frère Luc, a Recollet priest in 1670, of an Augustinian sister ministering to a familiar patient. So the painting done by Frère Luc is really uh, a summary, really, of the charism of the Augustinian sisters. We can see the Augustinian sister caring for Christ. Uh, and we, we really believe that um, each patient that we welcome here at the hospital, l'hôtel Dieu, right, literally God's hotel, we're caring for the person of Christ. And that's where we find Matthew 25, that which you did to the least of my people, that's what you did unto me. So the sisters created all of their uh, medicinal herbs that they used to treat their patients. Um, a lot were brought over from France, the, the knowledge that they had uh, in France, and a lot that they discovered here uh, in Canada, working with the First Nations people to be able to learn their, their, their practices. 
We know that uh, here the apothecary gardens represents as well Louis Hébert, one of the first families uh, to settle here in Quebec City, and he was an apothecary, and so he would have worked even before we arrived uh, serving the sick. And so the gardens here in the house uh, pay homage to him and his whole family, Marie Relette, his wife, uh, and all of the work that they did, and then that continues here today. Some 20 years later, in 1659, in Montreal, or Ville-Marie as it was called then, Jeanne Mance, who was one of the founders of Ville-Marie, established another Hôtel Dieu hospital and invited the religious hospitalers of St. Joseph from France to manage it for the small island settlement. These architectural drawings represent Hôtel Dieu in Ville-Marie from 1645 to 1695. It was much more modest in 1659. Sister Nicole Boussière, the archivist of the religious hospitalers, using the words of Sister Marie Morin, author of the Annals of the Hospitalers in Ville-Marie, describes the arrival of the first three sisters with the help of a painting by Francis Beck, which hangs in this marvelous museum on Pine Avenue in Montreal. Avec une coiffe et aussi un manteau, puisque elles arrivent le 20 octobre 1659. Alors, Monsieur de Maisonneuve les reçoit et va les conduire à la maison de Mademoiselle Mans, à l'hôpital ici. Et, et ici, voyant arriver ces premières sœurs, la population de Montréal, qui est pas très nombreuse, 30 familles, alors, sont toutes intéressées à voir ces trois sœurs qui viennent les consoler et les soigner. Here, in an original hospitaler apothecary in Beauger en Anjou, France, is an exhibit of some 600 pots and potions from the 17th century on that represents a skill in what today we describe as pharmacy. These images of the medicinal gardens in Beauger en Anjou would have been replicated in Montreal as a source of medicines used by the sisters in Hotel Dieu Hospital in Ville-Marie. This skill in medicinal herbs and potions, including opiates for surgery, is what one of these three sisters, Sister Judith Moreau de Brazol, brought to the New World. Alors, elle, je reviens à Mère de Brazol parce que c'est... La pharmacienne, elle est le pivot un peu à l'hôpital. C'est elle qui, qui donne... Euh, Marie Morin dit elle était comme un médecin et elle ordonnait les médicaments. On, moi, je déduis qu'elle est venue avec peut-être son livre de recettes, sa pharmacopée. Elle n'est pas venue ici les mains vides. Probablement, elle a pris quelques recettes de médicaments pour soigner les malades. Elle va faire ici un petit jardin pour essayer de cultiver les herbes médicinales, les herbes qu'elle connaissait. Mais Marie Morin n'est pas très précise. Elle dit que ma sœur de Brésol allait derrière la maison de Mademoiselle Mance. Il y avait des herbes folles, des herbes potagères. Elle, elle savait les cueillir et elle faisait ses médicaments. In her book, Along a River, the first French-Canadian women, historian Jeanne Noel proposes another skill, that of needlework, possessed by the sisters in the Hotel Dieu hospitals in Quebec and Montreal, served them well. She writes, Epidemics, invasions, and physician shortages required sisters to step in as needed. Skilled needlework would have prepared them to perform sutures, such as these pictured in this edition of French surgeon Antoine Paré's medical text, written in French rather than the traditional Latin, found in the Religious Hospitalers Museum in Montreal. They were known for very fine, skilled needlework. Uh, they were also, you know, the hospital nuns uh, used this extensively in their practice, and there weren't very many physicians in New France, so they were the ones left doing a good deal of the surgery and the suture. And we think, we wish we had more records on their day-to-day -day activities in the hospital. They're surprisingly scarce. But we do know that some of them came with training and experience from France. Uh, we know that they knew a lot about needlework. We know that they had scientific texts like uh, Antoine Perez in their collections. Certainly over the years, and we're talking here over 400 years, you know, uh, they, they were very um, instrumental in, in working in pharmacology, uh, you know, they also in radiology. 
So they, they, they discovered skills or they looked at skills that would help them be able to care for people and care for those who were sick. And uh, um, I know wound, wound, caring for wounds and dressings and all of those type of things were very important to them. And so they, they didn't want to just sit there and hold people's hands. They wanted to have competent skills to be able to care for those people who are under their care. Yeah. Both the Augustinians in Quebec City and the religious hospitalers of St. Joseph in Montreal maintained their hospitals in New France with a combination of generous endowments and ingenuity. One of the surprising things I discovered in my research was a workshop for making shoes in the Montreal hospital. Discovered this after the hospital, this was uh, recorded after the hospital burned down in 1734 and included in the inventory were 600 pairs of shoes and tools for making shoes. So this indicates a rather significant large-scale industry, probably um, carried out by some of the nuns, but also maybe recovering patients and perhaps occasionally the nuns hired work people as well. In light of the 2015 Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's report, which has challenged our understanding of the process of colonization, Canadians are re-examining settler and church interactions with First Nations peoples. Professor Noel offers an insight. Well, I, you know, it's such a huge gap between our sensibilities now, I think even among believers now, and believers of the 17th century, but they were very much deep they saw death all around them, right? People died young and there was a lot of warfare and they were very much believers in a very literal heaven and, and hell. So they thought that they were saving these savages, you know, these uh, people who had never heard of the Christian God. They thought they were saving them from uh, everlasting punishment or at least everlasting confinement to purgatory. And, you know, they thought they were helping, helping to open the gates of heaven. So yes, it, we don't sympathize a lot with that now, but I think if you, if you get into their mindset, they were, they were giving what they thought was the highest gift they could give to somebody, which was to help them to eternal happiness. And, and along the way, they, they were at least enlightened enough that they wanted to help their, bo their uh, you know, <laughs> sick bodies as well. So, so they endowed these hospitals for the uh, uh, First Nations and also uh, to serve the colonists. As depicted here in this contemporary painting entitled The Storming of Quebec, with troops scaling the cliffs, in 1759, the British conquered Quebec City in the Battle of the Plains of Abraham. And a year later, New France fell to Britain. The Treaty of Paris, which ended the Seven Years' War in 1763, forced France to surrender many of its colonial possessions, including Canada, to the British. With the end of the French regime came dramatic changes for the congregations of women religious who had depended on endowments from their generous French patronesses. The change of currency alone from the French leave to the British pound disrupted access to their endowments in France upon which they depended for the upkeep of their hospitals in Quebec City and Montreal. After the fall of Quebec, no new Catholic hospitals were established by congregations of women religious for about 80 years, from 1759 to 1840. Well, they were taken over by a Protestant power, and there was huge fear about that, right? The, the British had already exported the Acadians on the East Coast, and there was real fear about what would happen. But the sisters, um, they had kind of worked to integrate the British you know, into their network because they took care of British, wounded British soldiers as well as wounded French soldiers. So this fortunately won them a goodwill. So even though um, orders like the Jesuits were suppressed after the British took over, they didn't allow these, uh, and the Sulpicians, they didn't allow them to recruit. Uh, they allowed the nuns to continue. There were fairly good relations, I think partly because the nuns had lived up to that vow of hospitality to care for all the wounded from both groups. 
So a fair amount of goodwill. And we know that right from the conquest on, uh, Governor uh, Murray was uh, sending money to pay for British troops in the nuns' wards. From approximately 1840 to the end of the Great Depression in 1939, about 200 of the 278 Catholic hospitals were established across Canada in big cities and small rural communities and into the north by dozens of French and English-speaking congregations of women religious from France, Ireland and the United States. They often arrived in small groups of three or four sisters at the invitation of the local bishop to establish a hospital to serve the most vulnerable. Sister Anne Anderson, a sister of St. Joseph, explains how successfully establishing one hospital led to invitations to continue this ministry in other locations. For many congregations of women religious, this pattern is replicated across the country. I, I believe that it's true. I do think, and I'm sure that the historians will substantiate the fact that Canadian health care was put in place to a large extent by the sisters. The sisters' hospitals always had an open door policy. Anyone that came through those doors was cared for, regardless of race, color, or creed, and whether or not they could pay. And so, here in Toronto, when the sisters came in 1851, there was a large population of Irish immigrants who lived in absolutely appalling conditions down by the docks. And so the, the first place they came was down towards Power Street, where the sisters had a convent. And the institutions then grew up after those first, after the first, um, this group of sisters arrived here. Now, as I said, they arrived in 1851, and it, six months later, the Bishop of Hamilton, Ontario, wrote to the sisters and said, we have an epidemic of cholera and diphtheria. Could you please send us three sisters, or sisters to care for the poor and the dying and the fresh? Well, so they did. They sent three sisters. They came to Hamilton. They cared for the sick in the freight sheds. They cared for the sick by day, buried the dead, and then what to do with the orphans. And so that's how Hamilton was established. And again, from Toronto, London was established, and Peterborough was established, and from Peterborough, Pembroke was established, and again, from Peterborough, North Bay was established, or Sault Ste. Marie, as we know. And each of those, five, uh, each of those mother houses had healthcare institutions. In many situations, the initial funding for hospitals established by women religious came from what were called begging trips, where a small group of sisters began fundraising for a local hospital to serve the needs of the most vulnerable. These begging trips were made famous by a legendary Sister of Providence from Montreal. Mother Joseph, born Esther Perizot in 1823, came from rural Quebec and joined the Sisters of Providence in 1843 in Montreal. In 1856, Mother Joseph and four sisters traveled by rail, then stagecoach, to Washington State in the U.S. Over the years on this mission, she and the other sisters took lengthy, dangerous trips by horseback and riverboat into southern British Columbia. This was the age of the gold rush, and Mother Joseph and her companions traveled to the mines begging for precious gold dust and nuggets essential to their works of charity. She would give them a little piece of paper or a card, however that looked, and that would tell the person who donated, who assisted her, that they or their family would receive treatment if it was ever needed in a Sister of Providence hospital. That just fascinates me because to me that was really the beginning. So that was the beginning of, of uh, Medicare or, or our health, if you will, our health system. And what's also interesting about her is that she 
she is recognised. She's quite exceptional. She's honoured as a pioneer for the state of Washington. She's honoured by the Western Lumberman's uh, Hall of Fame as the first artist to work in the medium of wood in the Northwest. So she was a public uh, figure that demonstrated what an incredible contribution uh, these religious communities were making to their society. And this is in, it has to be remembered, uh, communities that were often vehemently anti-Catholic. So for the, the, the nursing sisters, their hospital foundation, their outreach, their service was very important to the whole broader mission of the church, the broader mission of, of um, of, of Catholics in, in North America. The inspiration of many of the religious congregations of women is St. Vincent de Paul, born in 1581 in a remote village in France. In 1633, with the help of St. Louise Mariac, he founded the Daughters of Charity, dedicated to work among the poor. They were the first non-cloistered religious institute of women devoted to active charitable works. Professor Siobhan Nelson of the University of Toronto and author of Say Little, Do Much, Nursing, Nuns and Hospitals in the 19th Century explains how St. Vincent de Paul was an inspiration for the title of her book. I looked around for a title of the book and I found there was a movie, an old French movie I believe, called Say Little, Do Much and it's it's a bit vague as to whether St. Vincent's ever, ever actually said that or not. It's certainly consistent with the spirit. And I just loved it, so it seemed, to, it seemed to hit the nail on the head of why these women were doing what they were doing, but also what gave them so much power, because being beneath the radar, um, not bringing attention to themselves, actually gave them extraordinary scope in the 19th century context to do things that no women were able to do to run boards, to run corporations, to do these amazing land deals, to carve out a space of industry and service that, uh, particularly in settler societies uh, of, of North America, but also all through South America, there's a whole different story in the Spanish-speaking world where they, they achieved an enormous amount. In doing it, they did it profoundly well and they did it with a great deal of proficiency and uh, and strength and abilities organizational abilities and um, and financial acumen they 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 had a they, they developed the skills they needed to do in order to do the job and and I, in my years of of working in healthcare. I actually, I am in awe of it. I, I sit there and think, wow. They did it under the, under the radar a lot of times, but they did it. And, uh, um, and that was a grace for all of us. During this period, many major Catholic hospitals established schools of nursing. They trained their own sisters and lay nurses who served the mission of the hospital and occasionally student nurses augmented staffing when needed. In the course of the 19th century, the fields of education, social service, and health care all professionalized. And for uh, women religious that were involved in running uh, institutions in the sector, uh, they became uh, very uh, very attuned to ensuring that their members were qualified. Uh, when pharmacy professionalizes, they, uh, the congregation sent their sisters to be educated as pharmacists. When uh, the nursing sector professionalized, they established um, schools of nursing within their hospitals. The leadership teams of the congregations were very focused on ensuring that their hospitals would meet the same standards as any other institution would. And what that required was that they dedicated the resources of their own congregations to ensuring that their women had the best 
possible qualifications. My sense of it was that it was about formation. So, so if they're going to have nurses, first of all, themselves as sisters, they had formation, and it was formation on the values of Catholic health care and, and, the, and, the, and the gospel values of compassion and caring for the downtrodden and the marginalized and those who are sick. And so they wanted to impart those values on the people that worked at the bedside. Uh, and, and it was very important for them because uh, certainly as, as sisters st started to some of them moved on to administration and they weren't always at the bedside. It was very important for them that the people who worked at the bedside had those compassionate values as well. And so, it, so a good way of doing that is starting schools of nursing and, 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 and forming these, uh, uh, these women, mostly women, uh, these women in the, in the values of Catholic healthcare, as well as making them good professional nurses you know, technical nurses. If we are going to do something, we are always going to look for excellence and continued excellence. So there's no nesting in peace ever. And as these hospitals grew, we never really worked alone. We always invited collaborators. And so we invited medical doctors, we invited x-ray technicians in the rudimentary sense as it, as it was developing. And nearly each one of these institutions, as particularly the larger ones, had a school of nursing. More than likely, the, schools, the, the students in the school of nursing helped to staff the institution. But always with that notion in mind that a nurse who graduated from one of our schools was excellent. And when the uh, provincial registration of nurses came in, our nurses always passed. We took great pride in the fact that our classes, graduating classes, certainly were more than capable of doing provincial registration. These women toiled in wards and operating rooms, often living in adjacent residences or convents attached to these hospitals. They drew modest salaries, or no salaries at all, and contributed their skills to keep their hospitals operating. However, in a male-dominated church, they were not always appreciated. But in the in the nineteenth century, the huge growth in female religious, hundreds of thousands of women joining communities, establishing communities, this was something that the church didn't really initiate. It's a social movement that almost overtook the church, I think, in the 19th century. But in the 20th century, uh, with the, uh, the promulgation of canon law, they regularized what were the expectations of religious women, particularly with respect to rules about how they could leave the uh, convent, uh, whether they could travel alone, whether they could be out at certain times and so on. And this led to enormous restrictions on their daily life and on their professional lives. Um, in some cases, I think it put them much more directly under the control of the diocese and so they were directed to where the diocese priorities were either into teaching, away from nursing, those kinds of things were all enabled through the creation of canon law and the autonomy, autonomy and the agency of these women was severely restricted. But canon law was not equal to the commitment of women religious to follow the path laid down by their holy founders. These intrepid women endured opposition, but inevitably stayed the course. Archbishop Murray of Dublin, who's a very important man uh, in the history of, of um, Irish and English-speaking Catholicism, he used to joke that the that the sisters um, always did as they were told, but somehow they always managed to be told what they intended to do. <laughs> so this was their skill. This is really why dealing with medicine was a breeze after dealing with the church. 1929 and the Great Depression tested the very fabric of Canada's healthcare system. 
but hospitals owned by women religious proved to be resilient. During the Depression in both Canada and the U.S., many hospitals were forced to close because uh, people couldn't pay their user fees. But Catholic hospitals tended to absorb the cost because nuns did stop getting paid for that period of time. And, and I know of cases where bishops informed women religious that they would not be receiving pay until the economic crisis was over. And this was an enormous stress for women religious. And if you could see the, the, uh, the congregation's documents, their financial records at this time, I mean, their major expenses were things like uh, for their own congregations, because partly because they often could live at a hospital. The women who worked at the hospital would live at the hospital. But their major uh, bills at that time were very small. Shoe repair, eyeglasses, um, and they, I know that they, they really struggled during the Depression to keep the hospitals open, but they, they did it themselves by, by not having um, new shoes, not having shoes repaired. In hospitals that depended, that, that had uh, labor costs that were not flexible, that many were, were forced to close. There's, there are estimates that 50% of hospitals closed in Canada for at least some portion of the Depression. Catholic hospitals, uh, as far as we know, no Catholic hospitals closed during the Depression, which is remarkable. And that's because women religious uh, did not take wages, they did without. They made do and they did without. One of the recurring themes that emerges from a study of the impact of women religious on healthcare in Canada is what congregations call their charism. A charism, which is often derived from the founder or foundress, is the inspirational purpose of a community, or its mission and spirit. Next, we will visit a congregation whose charism, like all 50 congregations who founded hospitals in Canada, is to care for the most vulnerable. Beginning in the 1950s and 60s, many Canadian congregations of women religious sent their sisters to establish missions in what was then known as the Third World. In September of 1951, for example, the Grey Sisters of the Immaculate Conception of Pembroke, Ontario, sent sisters to the Dominican Republic to serve the people who toiled in the sugarcane fields. They had been invited by the Scarborough Fathers, a Canadian missionary society, to come and start a school and health clinic for the poor of this region in the village of Yamasa. Eight years later, these sisters extended their apostolic work to the village of Consuelo, and set up a clinic to serve the urgent needs of the sick. Sister Eileen Skelly, whose religious name was Sister Thomas Aquinas, in an interview recorded in the early 60s, gives an eyewitness account of life in Consuelo. Most of the time there are more kids that are more anemic, and every day anemia, every day malnutrition, and that's the big problem here, I think, because the people don't have enough to eat. That's the... I don't know if they'll ever, because they only work when the saffron is on. That's the sugar cane refining. And when those months are over, they don't have any work. And I don't know how they live from day to day. Today, the Grey Sisters of Pembroke are still very active in the Dominican Republic. They have four of their own uh, sisters from the Dominican Republic who are working in pastoral work and a couple of them in, in directly in health care. They go out daily to visit in the Bates. Bates are small little villages that, um, where people were living uh, who are sugarcane workers and their families. And now they're much older and uh, not, well, not in very good health. So they bring a doctor, they bring a nurse, and they have a driver, and they go out every day to check and administer to the health care needs of um, the people in the various villages. Um, in Yamasa, both in Yamasa and Consuelo, we have clinics now and uh, Sister Mercedes Ramirez is the nurse in Yamasa 
and she's very much involved with people who come to the clinic. She also goes out to the bates, to the poor, and um, takes them food and and medication and so on, and sees to some of some of their ills for people who cannot travel in. Uh, their presence there is, is felt because it's really been a model for caring for the poorest. Even in their own seniors home, the residents are mostly Haitian who have nowhere to go. They're very poor, they have nowhere to go even back home, and now they're receiving wonderful care. And it really shows the dignity of the person that's really being said through the wonderful example of the sisters. In the early 1960s, the Roman Catholic Church, with Vatican II, redefined its role in the modern world. And in a document entitled Lumen Gentium, or The Light of the Nations, encouraged a more full participation of the laity in the work of the Church. Lumen Gentium encouraged religious congregations to empower lay people to help carry out their missions in education and health care. I think Vatican II opened up an avenue where we could invite more people into senior management. They had always been there, but perhaps it was embryonic until Lumen Gentium said, no, come along, everybody can be part of this. And I think that that was a really a significant time for us in beginning then to reshape Catholic health care for a new century. This decade was also a time when vocations to religious life began to decline. And with the emergence in the 1960s of a publicly funded health care system came a new challenge for women religious and their hospitals. On July 1, 1958, the Hospital Insurance and Diagnostic Services Act, what most Canadians call Medicare, came into effect with five participating provinces. And in 1961, all ten provinces were enlisted. It closely resembled what the CCF and Tommy Douglas had introduced in 1947 in Saskatchewan. This national program of health services, administered by the provinces and territories under the Canada Health Act, is by definition caring, accessible, and not-for-profit. This model of health care delivery was a familiar one to women religious in Canada, and the arrival of Medicare was a crucial juncture in the long tradition of Catholic health care. One of the impacts of increased public funding for hospitals was that sisters saw they were no longer needed, and that wasn't a negative thing for them. They felt that they had gotten uh, people to this stage, a couple of hundred years of service, and now if lay people could be paid properly, if there was enough money to actually run a hospital, they didn't mind stepping back. And it, of course, corresponded with their fewer numbers of women joining religious orders. So this was good timing, and in fact, many uh, congregations were eager to sell the hospitals at this point. It was getting much more difficult in the late 60s to run hospitals, and it was less important to keep running them if lay people could do the same job. So that's, that's the biggest thing that public health care allowed. It allowed to pay lay people to do the jobs. There was hope for Medicare in that it would ease the burden of the congregations in providing good care for people, for the poor and, and really for people who couldn't afford big bills. As the diminishment of the sisters came, they saw it as profoundly important to strengthen the ties that they made with lay people in their communities so that their, their work could continue. And uh, to me, that's one of the, 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 the lasting legacies of the sisters. Um, I know in my work of, of collecting historical documentation, people often want to see it, their work, as something which is only in the past. But I see that their lasting legacy is the fact that they were able to, in a sense, you know, hand over the reins of this great ministry that they started in Canada and continued to lay people to continue into the future. And so with the development of sponsorship model, 
now all hospitals, Catholic hospitals in Canada are basically uh, um, uh, administered and governed by lay sponsor groups. The healthcare issue of the 1980s was the HIV AIDS epidemic. It arrived as a worldwide medical challenge at the same time as the issue of sexual orientation and gay rights were emerging in Canada. Today, the Pride Parade reflects an attitude about the rights of gay men and women that is significantly different from the 1980s. However, in 1986, the Vatican Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith issued a letter to the bishops of the Global Catholic Church in which it described homosexuality as an objective disorder. And yet, a Catholic hospital, St. Paul's in Vancouver, founded by the Sisters of Providence, endeavored to offer care, comfort, and medical research into the HIV-AIDS epidemic that has won it world acclaim. Dr. Julio Montaner, a respirologist at St. Paul's in the 1980s, began to notice a particular manifestation of AIDS in patients arriving at the door of the hospital here on Burrard Street in Vancouver. During those years, um, I became involved in looking after people with one particular uh, severe, lethal, often, uh, form of pneumonia. Uh, it was so-called pneumocystis pneumonia. Um, we didn't have a very good understanding where it was coming from, uh, how it came about. Uh, it turned out that that was the cardinal manifestation of what it turned out to be AIDS, and eventually uh, HIV, the virus underlying the condition, was discovered. Um, the disease was predominantly affecting, uh, at that time anyways, and still probably today in our uh, mess, uh, uh, homosexual men. And uh, uh, this was a challenge, uh, uh, and it was a challenge for society at large, and it was a challenge for professionals of all kinds, uh, and institutionally, uh, it was uh, not easy to uh, engage uh, in the work that we were trying to do. Dr. Montaner has been recognized by the United Nations, has been awarded the Albert Einstein World Award of Science, the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, and many awards and recognitions for his work in AIDS research. More recently, Dr. Montaner was inducted into the Order of Canada and, in 2015, into the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame. You know, the epicenter of the AIDS epidemic in Vancouver uh, was happening at the backyard of our own hospital. The, 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 this was a it's sort of a gay neighborhood type of thing at the, at the time, still today. Um, and so um, a, a, a lot of people from the community, nurses, professionals, others, uh, uh, were uh, really working at St. Paul's. And it became sort of the natural um, thing for people uh, with these conditions, HIV-related conditions, uh, uh, to land in the hospital. Now, if I'm going to be perfectly candid with you, uh, there was also um, a, an element of uh, uh, other institutions, not to be named, uh, taking three steps back uh, at the time that this was all happening. And so, you know, St. Paul's was basically left to uh, pick up the, the, the largest part of the burden of HIV disease, which uh, um, people my age will remember, it, it was complicated. In, in the 1980s, uh, no one really knew what AIDS or HIV was. So the hospital made a conscious decision that in keeping with our charism and mission, these people would receive care. And that's basically how it got started. It was a, a motion made at the board of directors at the time and affirmed by the congregation, by the sisters. I was a young peon in all of these conversations, so I'm referring to you what it has been uh, sort of the folklore of uh, how we got involved in, the, uh, in this initiative. Um, I since have witnessed the sisters and their support, uh, the continued unwavering support uh, for the work that we uh, have done and continue to do. And uh, uh, I must confess, without their leadership, none of this work would have been possible. So you were managing more than just a disease. You were also managing 
you know, the, the reactions of the people around you, the reactions of your own staff, and things like that. And the unknown, the unknown. There was a lot of unknown. A lot of feelings around that. But first and foremost, it was, we care for people. These are sick people, we care for them. So that's what was done. And I came to realize that um, in an environment where there is a raging epidemic, uh, uh, to uh, operate uh, with a traditional model of uh, us in the ivory tower generating evidence and hoping that the evidence will permeate uh, to other levels of society is ridiculous. Uh, and what we needed is what the sisters did, is to speak truth to power and to say, you must do this because we know that this is the way to uh, begin the end of the epidemic. And the truth is that through our work here in British Columbia, we have seen remarkable uh, impacts that have informed the rest of the world in terms of how to control the epidemic. And I, I owe it to the sisters for having opened in that door. I owe it to the people of British Columbia and the government of British Columbia, regardless of stripes, uh, for having had the courage to support us. And more recently, uh, to the United Nations and to the support of the Pope uh, to be able to bring this to the rest of the world. The challenge in the 21st century will be to build on the legacy of almost 400 years of vision and courage. And in the words of Dr. Montaner, speaking truth to power. So who are the most vulnerable today and how shall they be served? Um, it's, uh, it, it's even going further than even uh, uh, health care, if you will, but it's looking at all the determinants of health. It's looking at housing, it's looking at uh, addictions, it's looking at mental health, it's looking at uh, people who, who are uh, homeless. Uh, Anybody who's vulnerable, the immigrants, people who come here and have no connection, no cultural connection, how do we reach out to them in a compassionate way so that they can have a good, healthy life? We will look briefly at a project that is still a dream for the future for a congregation of women religious who have identified populations of vulnerable people and plan to serve them. We will visit the Sisters of Providence of St. Vincent de Paul, who are planning Providence Village, which will transform their mother house property here in Kingston, Ontario, into a dynamic neighborhood community. Why Providence Village? Providence Village began as a dream because we knew that in our congregation, our ages were going up and our numbers were going down. And so we needed to do something with our mother house and our grounds that would continue on the mission of the sisters, the mission of our sisters, which does go back to the Sisters of Providence, which does go back to Mother Gamlin, um, is that of serving the poor. And so um, today we use the word vulnerable rather than poor, but it's the same class of people that we're wanting to serve, those who have needs in uh, many, many ways. And so we envision Providence village as being a community of diverse people actually coming together to, um, to live well. Well we have quite an extensive plan um, that will take us a number of years to complete uh, but the mother house will remain as it is today. Uh, we're not demolishing, we're not moving the mother house and behind me you will see a concept of the future of the property for uh, the mother house. So the mother house continues to stay where it is, but you'll see that there's a laneway that will be coming into the property called Providence Way. And along that driveway, if you will, will host a number of new facilities. One of them being a long-term care facility. We have plans to have a hospice Kingston, a residential hospice here, um, as well as affordable housing. So we've reserved spaces for various uh, organizations to come and build a new facility. That way our mission continues and we leave a legacy to the people of Kingston here that um, the Sisters of Providence made a difference while we were here in our 150 plus years. And so here, Ruth Brewer, the executive director, really is hosting a conversation with interested members of the Kingston community. 
People came with a passion. They came with a, a like-mindedness of um, helping the vulnerable. Everyone had their own idea of who needed the help. And bringing them together in a room was so powerful because they all contributed to those conversations in different ways. And so through those conversations, uh, we were able to bring these people together, strangers, into a large room, and then we broke them into small discussion groups. And from that, there was an outpouring of new ideas, uh, new passions. Um, there were tears. There was laughter. And so we were watching community become a, um, a, real, a real thing. And uh, it was really quite beautiful and very powerful. Providence Village honors the legacy and the spirit of the Sisters of Providence and St. Vincent de Paul by uh, continuing the services that they've provided to the Kingston area for so long. There's going to be a program for addictions, mums with addictions and their children. Uh, there's going to be recreational services. And eventually the Mother House will provide office space for mental health programs and a variety of other agencies, not-for-profit agencies, that are looking for affordable office space. So the vision is when the sisters, as they think about concluding their congregation, Providence Village is a concept that will allow us, as lay people, to continue the mission of meeting the needs of the vulnerable. I do feel that we owe a debt to these women. I think we should understand how important their accomplishments were and also the incredible obstacles that they faced. The, um, they had to beg and borrow every single thing along the way. Every brick in every institution they built, they got through begging, through um, cajoling, through maneuvering. They made uh, canny business decisions. They got um, influential friends around them. They had to manage the politics. They had to manage the bishop. They had such obstacles from the church's hierarchy. Uh, and despite all that, uh, they were able to, to put into creation, things that never existed before. Um, hospitals, orphanages, uh, schools, multiple institutions that served the incredible numbers of poor and, um, and, and, and needy, desperate among them. And they did it at their, for their whole lives, uh, often without any recognition and often at great personal cost. Many of them died young, many of them caught infectious diseases. It was heroic work and the social institutions that we take for granted and many of the professions that we take for granted were established by those women.